there's two things you need to know about Svalbard. It's home to the world's northernmost coal mine. Another few hundred miles and you'll reach the North Pole. And it also happens to be the fastest warming place on Earth. By a long shot. We've known for about a century that coal is a big contributor to global warming, accounting for around 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Despite this, nearly 8 billion tons are extracted each year. To better understand why we can't kick the coal habit, I packed my warmest clothes and flew to Long Yubian, Svalbard. In 10 minutes, the weather, it's a place where climate change is impossible to ignore. And yet the cold keeps coming, and coming, and coming. We're addicted to the things we know are bad for the planet. So why is it so hard to kick them? This is Preben Sorelvmo. After more than a decade of living in Svalbard, it's his first week on the job as a coal miner. Since my uncle been working in the mines many years ago, I wanted to follow like his footsteps and also be part of the history of uh, the mining community in Svalbard. Every year, around 120,000 tons of coal comes out of an underground mine that's covered in permafrost. The majority is shipped to Germany for industrial use. A quarter goes to the local coal-fired power station. And to keep Long Yerbian's lights on, around 50 miners work 10-hour shifts, two shifts per day. My name is Sven Jonny Albrechtsen, and I am a security inspector in the mine. How long is the drive in total down to where the miners work? Approximately uh, 15 minutes. Uh -huh. uh, we are going in seven kilometers, seven exactly. Kilometers. Yeah, yeah. Coal mines like this one have been fueling the world for centuries. This black rock powered the first factories, trains, and ships in Europe and North America. And as industries from steelmaking to steamboat shipping took off, so did our appetite for coal. It's a lucrative market for the biggest coal companies, and most coal today is consumed in developing economies in Asia to generate electricity, produce steel, heat homes, and more. About a decade ago, coal's share of global power generation started to come down. And in 2021, a number of countries agreed to quit coal power altogether by 2030 to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. That decline is being felt in Svalbard, where there were once hundreds of miners now, it's a crew of 56, and almost all the Norwegian-operated mines have closed. Except one, mine number seven. So we have rock up here and rock down here. Yeah. 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 So this is the fill in the cake that we take out. Yeah. Drive inside the tunnel and you're looking up. There's a mountain think about that uh, the first day and like uh, <laughs> it's thousands of tons over me right now do you think you could have done this work no <laughs> yeah you get the point here how difficult it is to get it it really is every day huh every day the plan is to close down both mine number seven as well as Long Yerbian's coal power station and transition to renewable energy sources like wind, solar, and geothermal. What we do need to get rid of, of course, first is the coal, because that's the obvious big <laughs> bad guy in this whole thing. According to the local government's findings, that move could reduce Long Yerbian's current CO2 emissions from energy generation by 80%. We have the opportunity now to show the world how a small society that is a bit off-grid can work on renewables only. The weather wasn't ideal in March, but if you look closely, you can get a glimpse of this future on top of Svalbard's one and only, but surprisingly well-stocked supermarket. It's uh, around 700 panels, 300 kilowatt peaks, one of the biggest uh, solar panels uh, or facilities we have in, in Longyearbyen today. 
but because it's so isolated, cold, and far from the rest of the world, getting renewables to work on Svalbard is challenging. Polar night, for example, leaves Svalbard in complete darkness for half of the year, which isn't ideal for solar panels. This is a Svalbard-specific problem, but the transition to renewables is challenging everywhere in the world. So that transition timeline uh, is something that has really been a challenge for a lot of countries to take on in eras where they're also dealing with global pandemics, with economic recessions and other kinds of disruptions to their energy system. Maintaining the security of their economy often is paramount. One disruption Lakey is referring to is Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which put a squeeze on gas exports. As a result, global coal usage crept back up. In fact, mine number seven in Svalbard was supposed to close this year, but soaring coal prices and demand from Germany's steel industry will keep it churning until at least 2025. Estimates suggest that coal demand in the US and Europe will still decrease in the next few years in favor of renewables. But across large parts of Asia and Africa, access to solar, wind, and other alternatives to fossil fuels aren't there yet. The actual generation source, the technology for wind and solar, is competitive. The challenge is the cost of the overall project may be more expensive. Take solar, for example. Not only do you need the panels themselves, you need backup batteries, connections to the grid in many cases, and a management system to oversee all of this. Those are the direct costs. Then there are the indirect ones, a coal dependency, if you will. One example is India Railways, which every year transports billions of people around the country. The company actually makes almost half of its revenue from transporting coal. And by overcharging its freight customers, rail tickets are more affordable. How do you make sure that the railway system will be able to be financially viable in India if you're no longer transporting coal? How do you think about the need for jobs and livelihoods for the communities that have been part of that coal extraction, the mining and the processing industries? In India, that's around 3.6 million people who work in coal-related jobs, with millions more in the rest of Asia. And Svalbard too. A school, solar-powered grocery store, and other facilities have existed here because of the coal industry. Shutting a mine down means a lot more than 56 coal mining jobs lost. They have partners working on other places. If you close the mine, you will lose a lot of people and a small place like Svalbard can save the world. I don't think climate change starts with us taking out the coal. But there's another reason why Norway has been reluctant to close mine number seven. And it explains why, of all the people to run into in an Arctic coal mine, I bumped into Norway's prime minister. This is Norway, and Norway intends to remain Norway. OK, let me backtrack for a second. I'm in Norway, but I'm also not really in Norway. Svalbard is technically Norwegian, but because of a treaty signed in 1920, anybody can come and do business, whether that's fish, mine, or even brew beer. It means that Norway needs to remind everyone they're here, historically, through coal mining. Longyearbyen, particularly, is not a regular society operating like any other town in Norway. Longyearbyen has a purpose, right? And the purpose is to be the presence of Norway on this Norwegian archipelago. But they're not alone. Just a few dozen miles west of Longyearbyen is Barentsburg, where Russia has operated a money-losing coal mine since Soviet times. Another 70 miles north is where China runs a research station, and the country has expressed interest in commercial activities in the Arctic. All of these countries see Svalbard as a strategic foothold to the resource-rich polar region, which is opening up for business, in part, because of warming temperatures. Uh, this is Norwegian sovereignty uh, under very special Arctic uh, conditions that we have done uh, in a responsible way for, uh, for decades and even centuries, and we will continue. In many ways, to quit coal anywhere is to tackle a really complicated equation, except the formula and the variables all look different for every community. 
It's a multi-billion dollar market that's still backed by banks and policymakers, especially in developing economies with growing energy demands. But it's complicated, even for the richest and greenest countries and the fastest warming places. If the richest countries in the world are unable to demonstrate the pathway to phasing out coal completely, then we are going to lose the fight to save the planet from potentially catastrophic climate change. Change isn't easy, but it's happened to Svalbard before. For centuries, the archipelago was just a hunting ground for fishermen and whalers. Then came industrial-scale coal mining operations, started in 1905 by an American businessman. That's him. John Munro Longyear, after whom Longyear Bien is named. And in this cold, remote frontier town, it's the coal sold in souvenir shops. The former miners' cabins turned into hotels, and the stories of people I met that are all rooted deeply in coal, even as Svalbard is changing again. So it's over 100 miners who were killed during the years from 1916 up to today. Yeah. This statue is really a memory of them. Lost their life in, in the mine. My father, he died when I was two years old in the mines. My father, my mother and my brother, they are all been working in the mines. So it's kind of special to be like the, the last one in the family member who is who's doing this. It's either you're here for three months and never go back because you didn't stand the dark season. And then you have those that are three years done. And then you're the lost soul like 30, 40 years. <laughs> Just loving it. Uh, are you, do you think you're on your way to being a lost soul? Um, Hope not, but I'm afraid so. <laughs> well, I guess it's a beautiful place to get lost in. Yeah, yeah, it is. This is the first episode in a series that's trying to answer a question that I've been wrestling with. Why is it so hard to quit the things that we know are bad for us and for the planet? Thanks for watching. Give it a like and subscribe to our channel. And stay tuned for our next video about meat. <laughs>